Welcome, everybody, uh, to our uh, annual December Mixer. We started this about, I'm going to say about four years ago now. And um, it's really an opportunity for us just to have some informal conversations, um, let folks ask questions, um, and um, talk a little bit about the upcoming year and the past year. So here's our agenda. A uh, little welcome in a moment here from um, Sue and Lisa. And um, then we want to celebrate our new members. And I'm, I'm not sure uh, too many were able to make it, um, but we'll, we'll definitely um, want to tell you who they are and then I'll let them speak up if they're here. And then really, we just want to spend time have, hearing from you and, and what's been going on and, um, you know, what are your hopes and <laughs> challenges. And then we just have, um, we had some questions posted uh, in our Padlet. And so we'll talk about those because uh, we have a really stellar set of experts on online here to answer questions and have a discussion and then a um, little additional information about next year. So Lisa and Sue, I want to turn this over to you. Hello, I'm Lisa. Nice to uh, see so many of you on the video. I'm glad to have you all here. Um, we just wanted to say hello, and it's hard to believe that it's December. It was just spring break and the world was normal. Um, but we've all done such awesome work together to serve our students and um, to, to work on the open education movement. And so it's really to see how we've all come together, how we shared, how we collaborated and how we've really reached out to make our, our materials um, open and available and inclusive is just awesome. And so I'm really just really proud of the work that you've all done this year. And um, personally, I just wanna wish you a happy holidays. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Sue. Hi everyone, Sue Tashin here. Um, yeah, I mean, really just building on what Lisa said, um, the past nine months for me has been a little bit of a blur, probably like a lot of you. Um, we've put 281 new courses online <laughs> this year. So working with faculty to um, get their courses, but I guess the exciting part about that related to open um, education has been the sharing and also the faculty that, um, you know, really weren't interested before because of the um, like digital format of open ed resources. Now they're really um, a lot more interested. I'm getting a lot more requests of, you know, to help people find um, materials for their courses. So. It's been, um, although very challenging, overwhelming at times, um, also I think it's opened up a lot of new opportunities. So I'm excited about, you know, once things maybe we have time to breathe and focus, um, we'll be able to, you know, really start um, promoting OER in different ways. So welcome everyone, welcome our new members and old members and we're excited to hopefully see you in person again sometime soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, Sue, if you guys have decided on the Massachusetts conference, the Northeast, will that be virtual? This yeah, year? we are actually having a meeting about it next week. So I think it will be virtual probably. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping, hoping by the summer, everyone who wants the vaccine can get it, but that it takes yeah. time while for that to really be a reality. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I just do want to call out um, our new members in 2020. And um, if any of you are here, I, I, I know we have at least one. Um, uh, love to have you say a few words. So um, Angelina College in Texas, and I don't know, are Christopher or um, Sarah able to join us today? No, I didn't think they registered, so. <laughs> I think they're buried in their end of end of semester um, work, um, and I know I heard from Hans um, Hans. I'm sorry at Moraine at Moraine Park Technical, and he's in he's been busy uh, doing interviews. But we're very pleased to have had two Wisconsin colleges join us. 
um, both Moraine Park and Waukesha. I hope I got that right. <laughs> um, Cindy will correct me if I got it wrong. Waukesha. County. It's close. Waukesha. Waukesha. <laughs> Darn it. I always get it. That's okay. That's okay. Then I have to yeah, I'll use that speaker thing. Okay. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so welcome to both of them. Um, Sunny Geneseo joined us. So, um, as well, which is one of the state universities in New York. Sunny OER Services has been um, a longtime member of ours. And in fact, uh, there will be one of the speakers uh, at our webinar next week will be Michael Daly, from, no relation, Michael Daly um, from SUNY OER Services. Um, we also had Los Angeles Southwest College join us. Uh, Parisa, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Hi, would you like to say a few words about uh, OER or? Um, sure, of course. Yes, um, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Paisa Samai, and I apologize for not having my camera on because I'm having uh, internet issues, so I don't want to get disconnected. Um, I am a librarian at Los Angeles Atlas College, and I have been the liaison, um, OER liaison uh, for the past two years. Uh, we just recently became the member um, of um, OER Global, and uh, we are, since pandemic, we, believe it or not, we have been doing a lot of work. So I was very surprised to see that our faculty are actually, um, you know, working on OER and they are more um, interested in um, closing the equity and access gap. So I was very happy and I'm, uh, I was very surprised at the same time. So I don't know what I'm supposed to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's, that's, one, that's plenty and that's wonderful, Parisa, to hear that. And uh, Parisa is, um, her college is one of, it's nine community colleges, right? Within the yes. Los Angeles Community College District. So it is our largest district in California, which is a very large community college system. We have about 115 colleges, so. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, also, Southeast Arkansas Community College joined us, and I don't know if Megan is here. Um, she's their instructional designer there, and um, they're relatively new to OER, but they had some really ambitious plans when I talked with them over the summer. Um, North Dakota State College of Science um, uh, also became a member. They were our first member in North Dakota, which um, also the Southeast Arkansas was our first one in Arkansas. So really excited to get members in both of those states. And I have a feeling Patricia is not with us. She's the library director there at North Dakota. She was out of the office until yesterday. So, and finally, we have a brand new college, which is in the process of becoming a member. Uh, they're a Massachusetts college, Bunker Hill Community College. And I think we have um, their instructional design OER person here. And, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, um, so I don't want to miss say it. It's pronounced Kate. It's Scott Gaelic. So, yeah, it's Kate. Uh, yeah, it's Kate. It's Kate. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, my official title is Senior Special Programs Coordinator for Digital Learning on OER. And um, we have grown um, out our OER program. We've been um, gone through a couple of different changes in how we um, use our course flagging system. So we've changed from one system to now a new system that is better um, at helping faculty identify their OER courses. And we have a few initiatives going on, which seem to be very successful right now in trying to get faculty to use OER material. And I was really excited to find out that we have um, our computer technology department using OER now, so which is really great. Super. Um, and does anyone have questions for um, either Kate or um, Carissa? Um, Kate, I had a quick question for you. Um, you mentioned that you're using a new course writing system, and I, I may have mis misheard you. Um, could you a cor Okay, course flagging system. Oh, so right. how students yeah. find um, OER in our uh, in what we call a self-service system. 
And you, it used to be a very convoluted thing where you submit a course and they get a, a designation in their um, course name. And we found that it was very tricky to do. So we just um, reflagged everything. And now it's not a quite a large process if we're going to flag something for OER and at the last minute another faculty member comes in and they're using publishers content, we can easily take that OER designation off so the students aren't flustered. Yeah, that's great. Um, and a lot of colleges have gone through <laughs> <laughs> difficult times with that in in California because there's different enrollment systems I know there's been just it's been a continuum and we've been legislatively uh, mandated to provide that since uh, January of 2018. And we and also had a fee system for about three semesters and it didn't work um, it just took too much time to check everything and it was, it, it was just it was just really kind of difficult to manage all the way around. So we we did away with that as well. So, and hopefully with all these changes that we'll get more faculty and more students looking for OER. And we also are doing a partnership with our um, student government too. So that is a phenomenal thing. Our uh, student trustee is a advocate for OER and she just, really has learned about OER in the last year and um, and so it it was really kind of an eye-opening experience when we were talking about you know a, a lot of students still don't know about OER still don't understand um, what it is so it's just getting the message out there to not only students so they can understand it but to faculty as well. Great. Wow. That's really impressive. Um, and I, um, yeah, we, we, in fact, we do um, work with students from time to time to share those uh, OER journeys. And so that, Kate, Kate that's something that uh, perhaps it, your student um, government advocate for OER might want to participate in. So please consider that. Well, wonderful. All right. Now, Cindy, I think you're going to just kind of lead a round robin uh, with folks and just um, everyone is welcome to share um, what's happening, a little status, because um, we have a pretty unstructured meeting. And so, um, yep. And I kind of, this is going to be completely random. I just wrote down people's names um, as they kind of popped in. Um, just kind of give um, an update of maybe kind of projects that are going on. How is it going? I know things have been kind of crazy this year. Um, so. Dave, are you still on? And if you're on, if you could just kind of give an update of how it's going or things that you've been working on, we'd love to hear from you. Finishing chewing. <laughs> I'm that waiter, our waitress that um, interrupted you during your yeah, meal, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, quite all right, amazing timing. Um, I am just feeling like I'm on empty. I think I share that with a lot of folks and, and really limping to the end of this, um, of this term. But I am encouraged. Um, there continues to be a number of um, positive progression aspects of OER on my campus at Grossmont College in San Diego, and um, and I'm continuing to work in an opportunity um, with the California Community College Statewide Academic Senate, and and that um, group is doing some amazing things. Um, so um, more to come, I think, as we um, we were brainstorming some goals, both locally and statewide um, in some various meetings in the last couple of weeks. And um, I think there was a consensus that we're just trying to, <laughs> to get to the finish line and then really um, jump back in uh, in January. Thank you for sharing. I think a lot of people are feeling that. Um, Andrea, are you still on? Yes, I am. Um, thank you. So I'm with Salt Lake Community College and it feels, um, I can echo, echo what Dave was saying. I, I think many of us are feeling um, ready for the next year um, and maybe perhaps a little break. Um, so at Salt Lake Community College, we've been working um, 
The primary goals we've been working around right now, um, I chair the Open SLCC Advisory Committee, and our primary goals right now are to help. We started a publishing program, a small publishing program, um, and it's uh, we're trying to add structure into that right now, into that process. Um, we have a workflow that we use, and so we're adding the support pieces into that. Um, so that's part of what we're working on the committee. We're also working on um, strategies for um, including um, equity, diversity, and inclusion into our OER initiative. And along with that, um, we are um, attempting to create a faculty mentoring program um, to help uh, faculty interested in authoring walk through the, the whole process of um, start to finish and publication. Um, I'm trying to think there's, there's one more thing that uh, we're kind of looking into different ways to maybe be more productive in research, um, but we haven't, <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. So we're, those are just a few um, key projects or, that are in our, on our plate right now. So thank you. Yep, thank you for sharing. Sounds like you've been busy. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Judith, are you still on? Yeah, Cindy, although I apologize that I have to jump off at or just a bit before 2.30 for another meeting, but but I do want to say that, you know, I, I, I empathize with Andrea and Dave so much, um, but one thing that we serve all Texas public community colleges, and what we've been hearing from them is a frustration that the grant programs that are going on right now, including both federal and state for Texas, are given, you know, are, are allocating funds for big projects, which generally are for complete courses, all the way up to zero textbook cost degrees. And the, um, you know, the, the, the application process is quite difficult and complicated and time consuming as are the projects. So one thing that we're considering, and I'm hoping to, to do this within the next week or two to announce it, is some small grants that we would offer to our member colleges simply for kind of uh, priming the pump for just, you know, creating one assessment or one module or just something to get people get their feet wet. And, and especially for faculty and IDs and librarians who haven't had a chance to create OER, just to get their feet wet and get an idea of what that's like. And then we'll require those to be contributed to our new state repository. So stay tuned. That's what we're, we're gonna hopefully be diving into soon. It's great to see everybody. Thank you. That actually sounds like a great project and way, really great way to get people excited and started in it. Um, I, yeah, I would definitely agree that big projects are scare people. Yes, Dave. Looks like you have your hand. Oh, you're clapping. I'm not used to Zoom. We don't use Zoom at our college. Um, Mike, are you still on? I am, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of things going on. Uh, we're continuing our work with our fellowship that connects renewable assignments with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and uh, continue to partner with Kwantlen Polytech in British Columbia and Maricopa to uh, facilitate that work. And then uh, the new initiative that we're focusing on is using OER to help decolonize the curriculum and um, bring in a, a opportunity for our faculty to bring in different voices into the, the classroom with the content. So um, that is just getting started, but I think we have some faculty who are interested in, in the project um, and, and I'll, I'll keep you posted as to how we uh, progress. That sounds like some amazing work. I love the way that Open Ed is evolving into some of this. Um, excited to see what you, get, what you guys are doing. Um, Rodney, are you still on? I am. I'm still on. Um, what have we been doing this year? Um, uh, well, we're slowly progressing towards some Z-type degrees. I, I guess I should tell you where I am. I'm at Central Carolina Community College in uh, North Carolina, so in the epicenter of North Carolina. Um, we started doing OER probably about three or four years ago where we um, it was driven really by some of our dual enrollment classes or 
our counties that we serve um, provide textbooks for high school students and psych and soch were killing them in the exorbitant cost of what they were having to pay for their high school students to buy textbooks all the time. So we approached some instructors about developing some courses for OER um, to teach them via OER. And so that, that's where we started. And in the past year, I've gotten approval from our admin to try to fund enough faculty to move towards Z degrees for both our associate in arts and our associate in science programs. Um, and that's going pretty well. We're making some major strides. So we've pulled, you know, the top courses from all those programs um, to see where we need to, you know, we'll start at the top. Um, unfortunately, last year I funded some people to develop our first two English courses. So English 111 and 112. And then the department chair came to me a few months after we'd paid people to develop them and they were supposed to be implementing them and said, oh, well, the faculty voted and we're not going to use OER, we're going to do something else. And I'm like, we just paid you to do this. And so we've had some setbacks, but um, we're slowly moving towards a much bigger OER presence on campus. Um, last year, we hosted a statewide OER conference in January before um, COVID hit and uh, was very successful. Um, and so we, our state is, um, our community college system is very, probably much less system centric. And so each individual college kind of takes on a role. And so there's really no guidance from our system office. And so it's been a real frustration because we have some really good articulation agreements between the community college system and the state system, or the university system, but they're not really, I don't know, it would be a perfect avenue to look at OER, but they're really not going to do that anytime in the near future. So it's each individual college having to step up and do all this work on their own. So, but I am in charge of our Center for Teaching and Learning. And so I get to give out money to people that want to do implement OER in their course. And so it's actually kind of a good thing for me. So it's good to see um, we're, we're moving beyond just the cost savings to the students and now starting to really focus more on our faculty and how OER can help them become better instructors as well. So that's that's the next step that we're taking is to start working with our faculty on andragogy in their classes and, and how this is going to improve their courses. So. so it sounds like some great work and it was Una and I were just having a discussion was it week before last during OE Global about dual enrollment and how that's really upping the ante with with OER and getting that pushed forward. So really oh, yeah. a big player with it. So, yep. Tina. Yes, I'm calling on you, Tina. You are up. <laughs> well, the highlight of our fall was having Cindy come and do a, <laughs> do, do a webinar for the uh, OER interest group with Michigan Academic Library Association. Uh, uh, about inclusive access or um, forced purchase, um, which was very informative. So I uh, highly recommend. Uh, that was a good thing. Uh, and so in Michigan, we, uh, there, the group um, that has kind of helped us stay organized or keep us organized or focused has been the Michigan Colleges Online. And we have a, a steering committee of a bunch of just people from all the Michigan community colleges who are interested in OER and working on it. Um, and this group decided um, that we would apply for the um, Department of Ed grant. Um, and the, 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 the dream is to create, help all of our colleges get to a Z degree by, um, uh, by developing course shells in the four different LMSs that we all use and um, for all of the, uh, the gen ed courses. Um, and so these are all colleges that don't have grant writing programs or grant writing people hired, you know, so uh, the librarians and the instructional designers and everybody was scrambling to try to put this together. I think it looks great. Um, but we all agreed that even if we don't get the grant, which we probably won't, um, even if we don't get it, 
uh, we will use the work that we have done so far um, to find other money for uh, to help support this um, and and work on it as best we can without without uh, huge funding. So I'm really excited about that. And and we went through everybody's courses and um, looked at, you know, some of them were using low cost. A lot of them were well, using low cost materials under $40, but trying to find the ones who that are actually free, um, that's, that are using all free materials. Um, and so it was, we, it was a matter of doing kind of an inventory of what we were offering and um, what we need to complete Z degrees. So we're waiting to hear about that. And um, we'll either be organizing to get a big grant or we'll be organizing to find a different way to do it. But I feel like um, it was a bunch of people who came together and are interested in, and that was very exciting to see. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, right now, um, uh, I'm working with Carl Weckerly at Michigan Colleges Online to organize faculty conversations. We've done this twice before. We skipped last year, but um, uh, each Friday in January and February, we're going to have several, between one and three, um, Michigan Community College faculty who are teaching with OER in a particular, um, in, in a particular subject. Uh, uh, just going to do an informal lunchtime conversation about how they got there, what they chose, what have been the issues, what have been the good things, so that anybody who is kind of thinking about it will have an opportunity to um, just ask questions of people who are who are are already doing it, um, and we we found that. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how much interest we get, but um, it seems like because of the pandemic and because everybody moved online, that there are more and more people who are interested in using OER, but like all of you say, they don't have the time. Um, and so we'll we'll just keep working at it, but I, I'm really hopeful that those conversations, and they're in sociology, philosophy, uh, composition, we have one in developmental English, and one in welding, um, so, and eight altogether, a wide range of topics. So that's what's happening in Michigan. Sounds like you're going to be busy. Yes. Um, okay, Tom. Tom, are you still here? Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Tu. I am an instructional designer from Florida Virtual Campus, FLVP in Tallahassee, Florida. I am in for Rebel Cummings Stowers, our director of digital services and OER, who is the official FLVP representative to the CCC OER. Uh, I want to keep you updated that uh, a lot of things have happened in the past five months since the Florida governor's veto of funding for the complete Florida programs in June. It was absolutely a very, very difficult time for us. And we really appreciate all the kind support from our wonderful OER community. Thank you so much, Una, Liz, and uh, many other folks. So starting from yesterday, December 1st, 2020, FLVC officially became an auxiliary of Florida State University. So our commitment to open education, OER, and uh, affordable education was, is, and will always be here. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Just let us know what we can do to help and we'll, we'll be there to support you. And Ted, are you here? Yeah, I'm Ted. I'm from Roxbury Community College, Boston, Massachusetts, the same as the zoo. And, but locally, I mean, for my uh, college, now we finish, we close the application for, we are uh, for spring semesters. 
and when we can review application and give award to uh, applicants. And we plan to provide the workshops like a series, hiding, looking for like a OER ambassadors, like a, the, the instructor who like a guru in OER things. And then we're gonna provide workshop like a series, like a we gonna focus on uh, open pedagogy and EDI, uh, equity, uh, diversity and inclusiveness in the content. That's our plan for Rocks Weekly College. Thank you, Ted. I think I had gotten everybody. If for some reason I missed you, please don't hesitate to speak up. I didn't intentionally mean it. Hey, Cindy, this is Dave again. You didn't miss yes. me, but um, I think my lunch was impeding with my brain power. So I'm just including a short addendum. Um, locally, we have been trying to streamline the process of, um, of identifying uh, zero textbook cost sections, many of which use OER, not all of them, um, but also now trying to um, incorporate a new system that would vet um, self-identified OER sources to ensure that they're actually OER with proper um, licensing. Um, and, and that one came, came about because um, during the pandemic, we had faculty who um, we're trying to save costs for students and, you know, hopefully unknowingly, I think, um, were, we, we realized that they ended up using um, some pirated links that were, were out there for copyrighted um, sources. So I, I don't think that's um, unique to, to us, but we are trying to now put in um, something to, to make sure that everything is the way that it is supposed to go. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think, I don't think that's unique to you. I do think that that, that is a, a thing. Anybody else have anything to share? Otherwise I will pass it back to Una. Um, okay, Cindy, um, you didn't uh, give us your update, did you? Oh, um, yeah, I guess that shows you where my brain's at. Um, like everybody else, uh, just trying to make it to the finish line. Um, our, ma our major update, I guess, this year is what we've really been trying to do is work on giving a package approach to faculty um, from a start to finish perspective with their with their um, with OER or open education from a. My do sorry, my dog is bothering me. Um, from a finding a resource to adapting a resource to actually creating a whole, I create a whole course now with our faculty. So I'm a team lead on their course design. I actually create the course within our LMS for them um, to help them use um, like open pedagogy within their course. I help them redesign their assessments um, to get away from all of that publisher content that they used to do. We're creating, um, I'm creating H5P activities so that hopefully when H5P gets their hub open, I can export them out for other people to use. So now we're creating almost like a whole open education package for faculty. So it's not anymore just the textbook or the resource, it's a whole package that they're getting now um, with a course. Um, so we started doing that this year and it's fairly successful, at least the first couple have been. Um, and it's actually a lot of fun to work with um, faculty members from start to finish on a course um, and seeing students actually really enjoy taking these courses. So um, that's, I guess, our big, big thing that we've been working on this year is that whole package deal now uh, for faculty. Ah, thank you, Cindy, and I yep. know at least several folks who are on the line today um, have told me about 
an effort in their state to do similar things, to add those ancillary pieces that um, faculty have really come to depend on. And it makes the change for them much easier. Well, wow, that's a really, really exciting um, updates from all of you. Thank you. Um, you know, I asked people to post questions in the Padlet and we did get, we, well, we got a couple of questions <laughs> and I think I know who put these in here. <laughs> they were not from people new to OER, which usually our new member meeting is really more focused on that. Although uh, I know that Kate is not new to OER. I know she's been doing this for at least four years, maybe longer. Uh, so uh, and we didn't get any of our, our newer, our members who are newer to OER. Um, joining us today, but I thought maybe we would take one of these questions um, and I'm going to read it to you because I'm sorry, I'm a little challenged with Zoom. Um, one of the, the I'm going to take just the top one and see if anyone has any feedback before. We just have a few sort of little CCCOER updates at the end of this that I'd like to share if we can before the end of the meeting, um, or you can always look at the slides. But and so the question I, that was posted here is, with COVID showing that remote work can be just as productive as on campus, many may choose to work from home even after this is over. I've heard that from a few people as well. Uh, what are some innovative ways to reach out to people regarding open education as we rethink how to get them on board? So we're not going to, uh, perhaps that's, and I don't, is the person who posted that here? I think that person left. You um, know, that was me. Oh, that was you, Cindy. Oh, wonderful. Then great. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought that was Lisa. <laughs> don't ask me why. <laughs> no, that was me. Well, great. Why don't you lead that discussion then? Because my, I was wondering, um, if you were trying to get at the fact that there won't be in-person workshops, maybe, or maybe a lot harder to get people together in order to. Well, I was thinking not just getting people together, but I'm just thinking it's, so before I was able, well, one, I know I'll primarily probably be working at home or two, even when I am on campus, faculty are not gonna be on campus cause they're gonna be working at home. And I can't just pop in somebody's office and be like, corner them and be like, this is why you need to use this. And we're not going to be having, you know, workshops on campus. And even if we do, faculty aren't going to be there. I, I don't think we're going to be having as much in-person meetings or in-person contact, even when this subsides. So how do we do that? Or how do we give our elevator pitches when nobody's going to be in an elevator? Um, Great question. <laughs> and people can easily del delete emails. It's how do we do those things? This is Dave again. That that um, the elevator pitch really resonates with me. I, I think you may be having similar discussions. We, we realized a couple of months into the pandemic that the conversations that took place by the water cooler or the kitchen or um, when you run into a colleague, when you're on your way from one meeting to the next, um, were not happening. And someone estimated, you know, that seemed to be about a fifth or a fourth of the work that, that used to be produced. Um, if, you, if you try to um, substitute email <laughs> in, in place of that, it, it, it just, not only is it not the same, but um, but I think th there's such a loss of that previous environment um, where those elevator pitches or you know running into someone and being able to convince them that budget should be spent for this. Um, it, it for me at least, it's so much more difficult to do that in a now um, more formal way with um, with a paper trail or an electronic paper trail and, um, and, and without tone. Um, so we're really struggling with that. I think it's a good question. And um, it's been a struggle on our campus as well. A couple of things that we've been doing is doing um, 
for instance, um, for OER um, Open Access Week, we had uh, open sessions for faculty to come in and ask questions and explore different things like um, copyright. So you get them in for one thing and you talk about the elephant in the room, and that's OER. Or um, I'm also part of the academic uh, and distance ed department. And when I work with faculty and someone says, oh, I have this um, question about material in my class, I, I find a foothold there. I also reach out to the department heads, the deans, build re strong relationships with them in order to get into department meetings. And I know that time is precious in them. So you want to make sure that your, your elevated pitch is right on the money for those. So those are some of the things that we've been doing. And also trying to get that one person in that department that you know is going to be your advocate and kind of work with them a couple of times and figure out how to get them involved in the promotion of OER. Yeah, love those ideas, Kate, around um, in really integrating the open into other areas that are, dare I say, mandatory. <laughs> so, uh, and making sure that open education is part of those presentations as well. Yeah, because it's important. We have our um, our provost and our VP and our president always at the end saying, if you need help with OER, just um, reach out to Kate DeVito. She will help you with all your OER needs. I thought at first I was going to get an avalanche of emails, but I haven't, but I want to. Um, and so, yeah, it's um, getting space on your college websites, getting, you know, especially if you can get, like, see if there's any social time when you can get together with some of the departments and kind of talk about it and say, hey, listen, you know, I have a great idea and do some things and you can probably promote some events and get with, like, you know, this this year we picked on, we got um, student government really involved, which was really good. And um, so, and that just took persistence. It's like, send a friendly email to people that you know that are already doing all that. Like, hey, did you talk to so-and-so or whatever? But do it in a friendly manner, of course, but yeah. That's great, that's great. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to share. There was another interesting question in, um, yeah, thanks, Sue, for that. We need more in, more intentional about getting on the agenda at mandatory meetings. <laughs> um, there was another question in here, which I thought was quite interesting. You know, we've been talking about faculty so far and the fact that um, for them, it's much more convenient perhaps to teach online now that they've, some of them have gotten over that hump. You know, uh, I know that in, in my particular area, a, a large percentage of faculty uh, live like more than 30 miles from campus. And so that's a huge ask to come in several times a week to teach. And so they probably would prefer to have that hour or two at home because we have terrible traffic here. Um, they probably prefer to, you know, they could do homework, great homework during that time. So, um, but the question that was also posed here is what about getting our students back in the classroom? Uh, after the pandemic, do students want to come back? Um, do students need to come back? Um, because some of them don't really have access uh, and those kind of issues. I wonder if people have thought about that part of it. Was this your question, Cindy, too? No, I can't claim this one. Okay, that one must have been Lisa's. <laughs> what, what do folks think about where students are at on this one? I mean, I can speak for, I think um, the majority of our students prefer face-to-face -face, um, classes, even though, um, you know, we have 
the students who like most of the students in our online classes now wouldn't have signed up for an online class before the pandemic. So um, they, I think that they'll definitely prefer to be back in the classroom. See, our students are weird. They say they want face-to-face, -face, but our online sections are the first to fill up. But that's because they say they want face when they say they want face to face what they mean is they want face to face the way it used to be and it's not so yeah it's the wrong question i think so what is what what's the question tina what, how would you phrase it uh i would say do you prefer online to masked social distance? Oh, we haven't even offered mass social distance face to face. You haven't? Yeah. No. It, yeah, the, I know. yeah. the only right. ones right now that are doing that are labs in the nursing program. That's it. That's the only ones that are allowed on campus. The rest of us are not even allowed to go on campus right now. I know that there that CMU Central Michigan University is doing, or at least they have been, or they were doing. Uh, <laughs> it's horrible for a faculty member to do this, but they have to teach both the virtual class and the face-to-face -face class at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what happens is they end up with two or three students in masks sitting in the classroom while they're talking to a camera as well and it's just i mean if that's the class experience that students are having well that's not what they want for sure you want a bunch of people yeah i guess my other question too is after all of this are students going to be accustomed to online learning and want to stick with it i don't know I guess that's way out of my ballpark. And I'm guessing that there may be some age related, you know, potentially certain age groups may have preferences. Um, you know, I think particularly the younger folks, um, you know, right out of high school may be more comfortable with something that's similar uh, to what their experience was before. And then of course, you know, older folks who have a lot of responsibilities potentially with, you know, may have a full-time job, may have a family. I, so. I don't, uh, I don't know, Una. Um, I'm help raising my niece and nephew. One is 15 and one is 12 acting like he's 18. Both of them hate the learning online stuff. Um, I never thought that they would be so, they just wanted to end. They want to go back into school. They want to be social. And it's really difficult for them to adapt. And um, although I think that their grades are a tad bit better because they have auntie uh, school teacher here, you know, making sure that they're doing their homework and uh, stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Judging from the two kids that I have in the house, I just don't know. Yeah, I think the students may really, I mean, particularly the younger ones may miss the social aspect of being with other students. They may be less concerned about having a teacher in the classroom. I don't know, you know, um, yeah, interesting. Any, any other thoughts on that one? I'm just gonna add that from, from my perspective as a counselor, I hear a lot of students that that lead with a, are we going to offer any in-person courses next semester? And and I hesitate to to um, categorize them because I think it's coming from a pretty wide variety of of reasons. Um, some students didn't want to learn online in the first place. Um, some students have health health concerns and issues. Um, some students want the socio-emotional, or maybe they like the, the online classes, but they want the in-person support services. Um, and, and I think um, 
demographics play roles as well. Um, I think we've, we've all seen some disproportionate impacts that has negative effects on many of our equity um, uh, progressions and, and OER is centric for that. So, you know, I, I appreciate the question. I think it's really complicated. I think there's more than two, three, four buckets. And, um, and, and I think my, you know, my, my, my main takeaway for myself is that different students need different things. And if, if we're only able to offer one or two or three or even four um, types of, of um, learning opportunities, we're missing um, what is gonna be best for some students who are gonna learn in different ways. good points. Um, well, we'll continue the discussion. Um, I know we're, we're coming up on the hour and I just wanted to give you a few updates. Um, so our regional leaders for open education initiative, uh, we presented at both of the um, conferences in November. Um, and that program continues, we're hoping to enter phase two in January. Um, which we will enlarge that quite a bit more. And so we'll be reaching out to all of you to find out um, how you might want to participate in that phase two. So phase one, um, Kate, maybe I'll catch you up some other time. I think Tina, you've been, you've heard a little bit about it. Um, so it's, it's, there's four work groups that have been working on um, solving common solutions across state boundaries, essentially. <laughs> That's the short answer. I also wanted to mention that CCCOER is working on an anti-racism uh, OER grant, I should say, uh, with the Hewlett Foundation uh, with California Community Colleges. And so we're very much in the early stages. In fact, um, a selection of, the, of a small faculty cohort uh, is being done uh, this week. <laughs> um, and so it'll really launch essentially in January and we'll keep you posted. We'll be doing webinars with um, various uh, faculty who are focused on that, but also organizations that are focused on anti-racism who wouldn't necessarily be part of open education. And those will be separate from our main CCCOER webinars, but we plan to share uh, the um, invitations to those as well so that you can keep up to date on, on those and, and join us. Um, Cause I think we have a lot to learn in this area. Um, our EDI committee continues to meet monthly. So if you're not on that list and you'd like to be, there's a bit.ly here uh, to join that one. I think, I know a number of you are already on that. Um, it's a learning community essentially, and they choose a monthly topic. Um, and we have another, we have another group that does this on the executive council, which is specifically looking at um, how to make uh, CCCOER as an organization more equitable and diverse. Um, and then we have a we have a super uh, webinar coming up next week with just a set of luminaries. Judith Sebesta is coming, Michael Mills, um, Michael Daly, and Richard Sebastian from Achieving the Dream on tracking your key program indicators for OER. So it's kind of part of this sustainability. Um, how do you make sure that you know your administrative executive folks uh, pay attention to OER and how it's supporting your uh, program your key program indicators from your strategic plans? Um, if you missed OE Global, everything's available now, or if you missed some of the sessions, um, and it doesn't matter if you didn't register, uh, everything's up there. You can go to this bit.ly OEG20 Explorer. You can search by author, uh, you know, whoever presented or by title, um, or you can create a playlist. And uh, Liz, did you want to mention the, what a playlist is? Okay, well, I think you're... Um, oh. The playlist feature is just um, uh, in the OE Global Connect forum. Um, we're just asking people to share their favorite um, links in a post. Um, I posted in the link for the uh, OE Global Connect. Um, Connect is open to everybody. So if you haven't signed up already, you can go ahead and um, click the sign up button at the top. And But you can view all of the, um, all of the sessions and view most of them have video and slides. And then if you want to create a playlist and share with the community your favorites, um, that's the link that is in the slide that Una put in the slides. And the link I put into the chat 
is to, we used OEG Connect for um, our conference platform instead of using like SCED or something like that. Um, so one advantage of that is that everything is there. So if you go to that link, you can see keynotes, live presentations, um, asynchronous presentations, all of it's um, in there. Um, and then the, the one, the bit.ly that Una put in is, is a more um, targeted link where you can search by title or presenter. Thank you, Liz. And we'll create a playlist. We just haven't had a chance because it's been such a busy few weeks. We'll create a playlist of all the CCCOER folks who presented um, and maybe some other playlists because I mean, it, CCCO, it was great to see CCCOER folks there, but the point of the OE Global Conference really is the diversity from around the world. And so we'll try and also uh, do one um, that would be of interest to, I know a lot of you are interested in the international work as well. Um, <laughs> sorry, this is really an eye strain. All I wanted to mention was we, our winter quarterly meeting will be January 21st or 28th. We're still taking votes on that. If you have a preference on January 21st versus January 28th, put it in the chat window now. Uh, and we'll pay attention to that, although it may not be the final solution. Um, our monthly webinars will restart in February, as always. And Open Ed Week is coming up in March, and we will open the Open Ed Week site um, early in January. Um, and then, you know, as we always do, we'll have quarterly uh, meetings. Um, there will be OEG board elections. Um, they start in February and they finalize in April. And then we will have an executive council refresh in May. So that's an opportunity for those of you who haven't served on the executive council and would like to be more involved in the planning process at CCCOAR, we, we would welcome you. Um, or those who've been on the council for several years and need a break, um, that's also um, available. And then finally, as Liz mentioned at the very beginning, I can't remember if we were recording at that time, OE Global 2021 is October 5th through 7th at the University of Nantes in the Southwest part of France. And we sure hope we can all go there in person um, and wishing you all funding to do that <laughs> if it happens. So thanks so much for joining us um, today. And I, it, we're open if people have questions or um, want to just hang out for a while, that's great. Um, otherwise, the meeting's officially over. Bye. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. See ya. Bye. Thank you.